I am Blake Awe, the news editor at Flagpole. We're here with uh, District 6 Commissioner Jerry Neesmith and uh, Jesse Hubel, who is also running for District 6 on the commission. Uh, that's over in the Atlanta Highway, uh, Mitchell Bridge Road area. And um, format's gonna be, uh, we have a couple of prepared questions that will uh, give the candidates two minutes each to answer, then we'll be fielding some questions from the audience. Uh, but first, I would like to give uh, Commissioner Neesmith and Mr. Hool a chance to introduce themselves. And uh, we'll start with you, Jerry. You've got two minutes. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank Athens for everyone for putting this together and uh, recruiting a very fine moderator. The, the district actually starts at Old Epps Bridge um, on West Broad Street on the other side of the river, on the east side of the river, between Tallahassee Road, well, Oglethorpe and Atlanta Highway, and then goes all the way to the loop and then crosses Atlanta Highway and goes to the county line with Tallahassee being the northern border. So it's a very large district geographically. And I am Jerry Neesmith and I'm running for re-election. I'm probably gonna have to talk fast because I wanna tell you a little bit about what I've done in, in, in terms of my public service. Uh, first of all, I was a founding member of the Oconee Presbyterian Church and an elder, that was back in 2001. And then in 2008, I was the founder, along with Jay Payne, of the Athens Farmers Market. And I served on as the treasurer and, and, and the community representative on that board for five years. Uh, and then I, I served on the, on the planning commission for nine years. Mayor Denson appointed, or appointed me to that, uh, which is a, an incredible experience. If you want to learn about things that are going on and problems and challenges, it's a great, great experience. I've been a county commissioner for seven plus years. Uh, I was one year as mayor pro tem, which was last year. I quit mayor pro teming in order to have time to run for re-election. Uh, I've been a member of the board of directors of the Advantage Behavioral Services, which is a community service board. Uh, there, there are several of them in the state, 11, I believe. And uh, it's very gratifying work. That's a safety net for people who need treatment for uh, beha behavioral disorders uh, and uh, substance addiction uh, for people who can't afford to get the treatment. Otherwise, they, they also have housing for women and their children who are making the transition from lives of, of addiction into productive lives. They have a 100% success rate in that program. They're also building uh, um, um, an inter, uh, a transitional housing facility on the campus of Advantage, which is off of, right off Mitchell Bridge Road. Uh, which is being paid for uh, with this BLAST initiative that I sponsored. Um, I'm the liaison um, on the, um, and a proponent of the airport authority. I've been doing that for, uh, since Sharon Dickerson left office. Uh, I'm the liaison and proponent of the Oconee River Greenways Commission and help them gain a voice uh, with the commission uh, they're very hardworking people, been around a long time, but they weren't getting a voice on the commission, and I'd be, I was sure to make that happen. Um, All right. My... Thanks. I'm going to have to stop you there. Sorry. Okay, fine. Uh, but uh, Jesse, you've, you've got uh, two minutes to introduce yourself, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Blake. Thanks, Jerry, and all y'all at Athens for everyone and everyone who's making this debate possible. Um, I'm really excited for this debate, and I hope it will clarify some things for those watching. I think we'll gain some clarity on how different my approach to leadership is from our incumbent commissioner. And I'm excited to elaborate on our campaign's platform to get into the specifics so it becomes clear what each of us holds center and how that will guide the decisions we make in the next four and a half years. And, and more importantly, what legislation and policies will champion in that time. But most importantly, I'm excited to clarify that I'm not here to take someone else's seat. I'm here because I see a need. I'm here to stand with the people of Athens to collectively bring about the transformation we know is long overdue. And you know, I know the local government, let alone one commissioner, is not going to build a utopia here. There are bigger forces at work. So the questions are, what guides us? Who will we stand with? And what will we really fight for? Um, how committed are we to make sure that we do as much as we can to stretch those limits and make a real difference in this community together? I'm really proud of the work I've been doing in this community for more than a decade, um, having worked with and co-founded a number of organizations, including Athens for Everyone, and uh, the work I do with Nucci Space as the operations manager. And I'm really excited to bring that experience into this role. So thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, our first question is about Georgia Square Mall. 
Uh, as anyone who's been to the mall lately knows, it's um, there are a lot of vacant uh, storefronts in the mall and malls all over the country have been closing. Uh, so what, what, what are your ideas for the future of the mall? Uh, Jesse, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so I think I'd like to start by explaining my understanding of the current mall situation, which is that it's owned by someone who's reluctant to sell. And, um, and so that means that we have to do some negotiating to find a way forward that can really involve the community in this. Um, but when I think about the mall, I like to tell the story of downtown Athens, which was a story of corporate flight from our downtown, which really kind of was the mall in the 70s, to <clears throat> what is now the mall. Um, and since then, we've seen the follow up to that, which is corporate flight, flight from the mall and other areas in the highway to Oconee County. Um, I look at the mall and I see possibility. And I don't think that that's begging corporations to come back and pay people poverty wages to sell us things we mostly don't need. Um, I see extensive infrastructure that can be repurposed into whatever we dream will best meet our needs. And that could look like a community center or a rec center, a skate park. These are some fun ideas I've heard. I love the idea of housing, especially co-housing being a component, truly affordable housing that meets the needs of low income and low wealth Athenians, um, as well as perhaps space for a worker center or something like that, space for people to organize themselves in their community, uh, especially around working rights. Um, so that affordable housing is more affordable de facto because people are earning more. Um, but I believe the role of a district six commissioner in all this is to facilitate a community led process from which a plan is formulated and then the people of Athens and especially of District 6 carry that plan out. I think it's going to take a commissioner who's prepared to do real outreach to facilitate that process, to kind of step up and step back and lead from behind. And I think we have to remember in all this that government can't legislate creativity. I think the best solutions are gonna come creatively and that looks like participatory budgeting, participatory government, things that will yield civic engagement. And then from within that kind of withering corporate shell I think we'll see new life grow. So there's a whole section on our platform called Build and Share Power that touches upon a lot of this. Thank you. All right, thanks. And uh, same question to you, Jerry. You serve on the Atlanta Highway Committee, so you've had a, kind of an insider's view of this. Tell us your thoughts, please. Yeah, we started working on the whole, the whole Atlanta Highway Corridor, uh, Mike Hamby and I in particular, and we founded a group called the Athens West Corridor Group which is a group of business owners along Atlanta Highway. Um, so they have given us some good ideas and we've, we've actually got some projects that's coming out of that. The mayor and I met with um, Charlie Hendon, who owns them all, Hendon Properties, uh, last summer. And he showed us some ideas. They were actually drawings, sketches, if you will, of uh, converting them all into a, a multi-use uh, facility multi-use being housing, uh, office space, uh, retail, and a park. Uh, we have plans to turn the old theater into a um, stormwater detention facility, which could actually be a feature of the, of the, of the, of the park. Um, uh, Mr. Hendon uh, liked that idea. Um, I think what we have to do is continue to engage with uh, the owners of the mall. They're committed to continuing the operation of the mall and making these changes that they tell us uh, and be ready to uh, help facilitate the changes and, and help direct them in whatever way we can. One way we can do help direct them is uh, to uh, have zoning and land use ordinances in place that encourage, encourages such things as affordable housing by giving density bonuses. We can also facilitate redevelopment through uh, tax abatement uh, and the other thing that the mayor and I talk about a lot is creating a, a tax allocation district for that area so that we can direct uh, um, property tax revenues into the capital uh, improvements around the area, including a, a, a large part of Atlanta Highway. We have to be patient. We have to stay engaged with the owner. We have to look at our zoning laws and, and adjust them in any way we can to encourage redevelopment, not only of the mall, but Lexington Road, Atlanta Highway. Uh, so, you know, that's 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 where we are. OK, thanks very much. And uh, we'll go to you, Jerry, uh, first for the next question, uh, which is uh, how would you improve uh, the transparency and effectiveness of EMS service? Well, uh, yeah, I, I am uh, 
on the EMS steering committee. Uh, Andy Herod and I were appointed by the mayor. Um, it definitely has a problem when it comes to transparency. In fact, uh, I, I stopped going to the meetings when uh, our attorney uh, gave us the opinion that those meetings are, are subject to the Georgia Open Meetings Act. In fact, there hasn't been a meeting of that group since the, the attorney issued that, that letter and he sent it to all the members of the Oversight Steering Committee. Uh, so that's the first thing, the meetings have to be open. Uh, that's as far as transparency, that has to happen. The meetings, there are no secrets in that meetings. Their, their concern has been about HIPAA, about patient records. I don't think that's really a problem, quite frankly. I haven't seen anything. Uh, there are some data that might, might point to a specific person, uh, but even then, uh, that's, that's easy to avoid. They need to show their response times uh, and, and have, a, have an open conversation. All right, uh, thanks. And let, well, let me just follow up real quick with you, though. Um, I, you you were a uh, a supporter of national EMS for for some time. What what was it that changed your mind about the need for greater uh, greater transparency? Well, the our former attorney had the opinion that they weren't subject to open meetings; that it was their choice, and so that's where we were. Um, so a supporter, I mean, I was a supporter, you know, that, that it's, you know, it is a private concern that it's the hospitals, St. Mary's and, and, and Piedmont that, that share the lion's share of the costs of that operation. We give a hundred thousand dollars a year to the operation, which by the way, makes it subject to open meetings. And that's the attorney's opinion. Uh, so, um, and they, they've made some terrible public relations blunders. And I don't, I won't go into that except to say that Andy and I kept telling them, you need to, you need to release this data. You need to show your response times. And then we had that incident at Chase school where they reported one thing and then they turned around later and said, no, that's not really what happened. Right. And uh, I was very, very disturbed by that. Yeah. That was at a, I believe it was a barrel. It was barrel. It was barrel. Yes. Uh, where there was a, just for the viewers, uh, there was a child who had a uh, allergic reaction and uh, they called uh, EMS and the ambulance never showed up and the parents had to come and take the child to the hospital. Um, and then uh, there was some conflicting information coming out of the company about why that occurred. Right. Uh, well, the ambulance did show up, but it was sent away right. because the parents uh, had taken, taken the child to the hospital. Yeah. Um, but so let's, let's, let's go to Jesse. Jesse, uh, same question to you about uh, EMS service. Sure. And uh, real quick, I'd just like to follow up on, on the mall plan that um, Commissioner Neesmith uh, was mentioning. I think a lot about that seems process, uh, promising, but it's really important to involve the community in that process. Before shelter in, shelter in place, we were doing a lot of going door to door and no one I talked to knew about that plan. Um, but with EMS, we don't have that challenge because we've already had community members stepping up um, it's been on the Athens for Everyone platform for years, and that's because folks who have worked as paramedics and nurses have been vying for making these changes for a long time. Um, I'd like to start with a little bit of background. Um, National EMS got the contract in the wake of the recession. All over the country, they got these contracts on local and state level. And um, it's a for-profit company that took over a public service. It used to be kind of a, a, a public and private mix of the two hospitals um, working together to do the ambulance service. And then National took it over in the recession. And, and that's when this body, this oversight committee um, was established. And all along, they've been having problems of meeting their times and they've been lying and covering up a lot of their failures. They have an abysmal track record nationally that there's plenty of press about. And of the 11 people on that oversight committee, um, commissioners Herod and Neesmith do sit. And what we've been wondering for years is where they've been. You know, why only now in this election cycle, why only now after the attorney, our new attorney has said that it has to be opened up to the public, have they changed their tune? Um, and also it's not just about opening meetings, it's about a lot of things. Uh, back in the day, I believe Commissioner Neesmith said that um, he's not interested in us getting into the EMS business, but I disagree with that in two fundamental ways. The first is that EMS is not a business. You know, if there's a public service that to me seems so obviously by and for the public good, it's helping people in a crisis, in an emergency and showing up with an ambulance. 
And I don't think that a for-profit company has any business in that. But certainly, for as long as we're stuck with this contract, we can do a lot better. And so I think there's four steps to get us to where we need to be, with the ultimate goal being that our fire departments who are already stationed around the community having um, ha uh, being in charge of the paramedic services. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to take like 10 more seconds to say that that four-step plan, which has been on AFRI's platform for um, years, is to adopt and fully implement the athens Clark County's own police department's recommendation from April 2019 to take over 911 dispatching, and then to keep taxpayer-subsidized 911 ambulances in their coverage zones, which is easy to do with the fire departments, um, to increase transparency, um, which is you know not only opening up the meetings, but if they're going to stay closed, dig in, get that data, and share it out to the people, um, and to upgrade our fire department finally so that we can transition back to being a public service. So, thanks. Sorry for going over. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll let you have May a little I, time. May, because I, I, may I rebut? Uh, briefly, please. please. Okay, first of all, um, Andy and I have only been on the EMS Oversight Committee for maybe two years, and it's because we insisted on getting insight. We said we need representation on the Oversight Committee. We had none. And that's why we're on there. Uh, second of all, uh, over the last, I say, four years, we have spent a great deal of money training uh, our fire, our firefighters to become EMTs and equipping them. And basically EMTs are dispatched out of most of the fire stations and they get to a scene quickly, a little quicker than EMS you know, because they're closer and they provide uh, life-saving treatment uh, when it's needed for strokes, heart attacks, bleeding, serious injury. Uh, and that works. Now, 911 is a problem. I totally agree. We've got to fix that. And this is one of the reasons that Andy and I got on the EMS Oversight Committee is to try to figure out how to fix it. We haven't made much progress. I am, I am disappointed in the dialogue that we're getting from that Oversight Committee and, and the people that are involved, the hospital, hospitals and EMS. And by the way, the contract does belong to the hospitals. Okay, um, moving on to the next question. Um, this, this involves, uh, some work that's already been done on the commission. So I'll let Jerry answer this first. Uh, what was your plan for the prosperity package before the majority of that fund was redirected to coronavirus relief? And do you want to replenish it? Yeah, there was a commission committee formed, uh, which, which I, I'm not on, uh, that was working on how do we uh, disperse this funding. And they were working on uh, basically grant application process so that our community partners could could propose programs and ask for money, and then we would we would pick pick the ones to go with. But as you said, that's over with now because we're spending the money in a more more immediate way. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I'll rephrase this a little bit for you, Jesse. But um, do you want to replenish the prosperity package? And if so, what would you? Uh, spend that money on. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think we need to remember that the prosperity package was generated from a community led suggestion. And I believe that was modeling the idea off of what Wes Bellamy did in Charlottesville, Virginia, I believe. And among the many um, proposals that were a part of that, I think uh, a, a community leader that a lot of people are probably familiar with, Roderick Flanagan, was pushing for baby bonds. And there's been this question the whole time about the gratuities clause, which is in the, the state charter um, that would prevent us from doing baby bonds potentially. Um, but this question about how to get around the gratuities clause to meet the need of the 38% of people who are living below the poverty line in this community has been being asked long before coronavirus was a thing. And so now, you know, I'm really, really excited to see that the mayor and commission are unified with the manager's office to try to find a way around the gratuities clause to meet the need. I think we need to recognize that in this pandemic situation, this crisis is just exacerbating pre-existing crises of poverty and inequality and lack of affordable housing of hundreds of people who are homeless and only a fraction of them have access to a bed on a given night. And, um, and so I'm hoping that this moment is going to lead the way, is gonna help us pave the way for bringing the prosperity package back um, but much more meaningfully to find a way forward, you know, because they sat on that money for about, it was $4 million allocated and less than a quarter of it had been allocated after about a year before coronavirus came about. I think that we need to find ways to take action. There are things that we can model, um, model that action on that have already happened in other cities. So. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, next question, uh, the, well, Jesse, um, I'll give you the first crack at this one. Uh, the federal government recently passed a $2 trillion relief package that will provide many adult citizens uh, and permanent residents with uh, $1,200 each. However, the underdocumented immigrant community and many homeless families will not receive this relief. Uh, what will you do as an athens Clark County Commissioner to provide relief to the most vulnerable members of our community? Sure, so a part of this goes back to the last question, actually. You know, I think we need to find creative solutions to get money to the people who need it most. You know, I talk a lot about how in our community, we've been hearing for as long as I've lived here um, that we have this immense poverty crisis. You know, this poverty problem, it's become like a talking point that I'm sick of hearing about. Um, and, and part of what I'm really wishing we would hear more often is this problem of wealth inequality, you know, because we're also the 12th worst county of any community in the country when it comes to wealth inequality. So there's wealth here, we just need to find a way to share that wealth. Um, and this crisis is highlighting all the places that most need it. But all these places that most need it, all these people and families who most need it, already needed it before coronavirus. And so the solutions I think we need to be most focusing on now um, need to be aligned with helping the people whose needs already existed before, who were already in a precarious, vulnerable situation before. In the undocumented community, we have about 3,200 households in, the, in Athens, Clark County, that contain an undocumented member or an underdocumented member. We need to find ways to loop those people into the processes that we're building. And I think the prosperity package and allocating money um, through that program into um, probably some kind of development authority or nonprofit entity who can then get it more directly to people is, is one of many ways that we can do that. There was a really great resolution passed last year by the mayor and commission. Um, my understanding was that while there was a unanimous vote in favor of it, that the uh, our incumbent commissioner, Neesmith, uh, actually had kind of mixed feelings about it. So I'd, I'd love to hear if you fully support the language in that resolution. And then I'd love to hear how Commissioner Neesmith thinks that we can take meaningful action, because I feel like we could have already been doing that. We certainly need to be doing that more. And, and ultimately, the best way to do that as a leader in our community, as someone who has the privilege to even run for office in the first place, never mind have access to the, the social and financial capital that many of us who are, are white or otherwise have access uh, have, is to get behind the people who are directly affected. So to get behind groups like Dignity Bad and Grande in Athens and stand with the Athens Immigrant Rights Coalition to make these changes. Okay, thanks. And uh, so same question to you, Jerry, about uh, relief for uh, homeless families and underdocumented immigrants who are not eligible for federal benefits. Well, first of all, I've, I've met with the, uh, with the, the un underdocumented citizens a number of times with their organization. Uh, and have uh, a great deal of, of empathy for them. Um, the, the, the prosperity package, uh, you know, it's only $4 million. That's not much money. So we do have to prioritize how we allocate that money. Uh, I think some of it certainly should go to that, to that community. Uh, but we also have many un, un, underserved communities. Uh, one of the things we did with the prosperity package is we, we hired 16 neighborhood leaders. Uh, the, their purpose is to help people find resources that already exist. Uh, that program is just getting off the ground. They're getting involved now with, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, my problem that I had with the resolution wasn't the resolution. It was the process. As Jesse said, the community needs to be involved. That resolution hit, uh, hit our desks about 24 hours before the, the meeting in which it was discussed. And there were no citizens there except for the, the immigrant community. And that's because no one knew about it. So it wasn't an open conversation. That's what I objected to. The commissioners did not have a chance to debate, to refine the language of the resolution. Uh, it, it, the time just wasn't there. That resolution was important enough and controversial enough that it needed to be in the public before it was adopted and it wasn't. May I just follow up for 30 seconds? Uh, okay, yeah, 30, and, and just, just, for, just for clarity, this was a resolution that the commission passed in support of the, uh, in support of the immigrant community locally. Um, so if, 30 seconds, Jesse, go ahead. 
I, I think something's been revealed in, in what you're just saying, Commissioner Annie Smith. Um, you know, first, not to be too nitpicky, but the use of the term undocumented citizens, they're, they're literally not citizens, and that's part of the problem. You know, they're residents of the community, they're part of our community, but they don't have citizenship status. And so their access to these processes that are in place in the local government and around the community where citizens do have that access is, is just fundamentally different. And so I think that we had everyone we needed in the room when that resolution was brought forth because it was brought forth by people who are generally afraid to come downtown and have a hard time getting there. And I don't see who else we needed there besides the people who are directly the people who make the decision. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we have another question uh, regarding a rather controversial uh, resolution. Uh, people of color in Athens and particularly black residents face systemic challenges when it comes to building wealth, accessing, accessing services and securing freedom from the hands of a criminal legal system that disproportionately targets folks of color. How will you support reparations for black communities harmed by Athens and UGA's racist policies? Do you believe the Linentown resolution uh, that's referencing uh, a neighborhood that was bulldozed to make way uh, for the uh, dorms on Baxter Street back in the 70s. Uh, do you believe the Linentown resolution is ready to be passed as it is written by the residents? And do you support an ad hoc committee composed of Linentown residents specifically for implementing the resolution? Um, who did I go to first last time? I think Jesse. So Commissioner Neesmith, uh, you can have that one first, please. Yes, I met with a couple of uh, Russell Edwards and I met with a couple of, uh, of the Linen Town, um, the children of Linen Town who are now my age. Um, and uh, it, it was a, it was a new story for me. And uh, uh, it was heartbreaking to hear how much how much effect this had on their on their families. Um, I volunteered, uh, as did Russell, to help them take that resolution uh, and take it to each commissioner and craft it and with the mayor craft it in such a way that it, it, it was legal because there are things in there that we cannot do and take it to UGA and work with them to get them to agree to some sort of reparations and, and uh, memorialization of the process. Uh, my offer was rejected. Uh, the offer still stands. I want to help them. That resolution, it's up to the mayor. It's up to the mayor to put that resolution on the agenda. He has chosen not to. I don't have the power to put it on the agenda. Um, so I, I would like to go forward with it very, very much. But we have to, we have to open it up to, uh, to make it legal, to make it something that can be done, something that UGA agrees to do in terms of the scholarship idea, of the monument idea and all those things. I, I fully support the concept. All right, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, Jesse, same question to you about reparations in Linden Town. Uh, so flatly, I'll just begin by all the questions I heard, my answer is yes. Um, but to elaborate, you know, first, uh, the Linden Town folks, the folks who have been leading this, many of whom are residents who lived through this and are choosing to relive their trauma and share their story to try to make it right, is their words. Um, they've been deeply displeased with Commissioner Neesmith's response and the response of many people on the on the commission. So I can't speak for them as to why, except to say that they see a lot of daylight in this. Um, almost everyone involved in that process, I've only met once they began to make it public also. And I think there's just kind of like a subtle, perhaps, difference in our approach to how we try to work with and get behind folks who are doing this. But when it comes to folks who have suffered in our community and who are still suffering, I think it's important for us to follow their lead. And so just like the resolution we talked about regarding under an undocumented residence of Athens Park County, I think the mayor and commission needs to largely be in a supportive role of the Linentown residents and black residents of this community or their descendants who live in other neighborhoods or whose descendants lived in other neighborhoods that went through similar processes of urban renewal. You know, People are afraid to say white supremacy or terrorism, but that's exactly what was happening all over the South. Athens Park County was no exception when it came to white terrorism and the KKK and lynchings happening here. And, and that legacy was you know, carried on through Jim Crow and through urban renewal. And, and so ultimately, if we're gonna try to find a way to recognize that story, 
Uh, we need the people who lived through it, or at least the closest we can get their descendants to be the ones telling it. And if we're going to find a way to redress that harm, then we also need to let the folks who have been harmed define what that looks like. Um, I believe that if the commission got together and requested that Mayor Gertz assign it to their committees, Mayor Gertz would do that. He has a pattern of supporting Commissioner Will. Right now, we just need more people on the commission to support it. Okay, thanks. We've got another UGA question. Uh, Jesse, I'll go to you first on this one. Uh, UGA is the largest employer and sets the standard for wages in Athens, uh, but many of its employees make well under $35,000 a year, which the Economic Policy Index's family budget calculator considers a living wage for a single adult with no children in this county. Do you think UGA has a responsibility to increase its minimum wage? If so, what will you do as commissioner to urge the University of Georgia to increase wages and provide a living wage for all of its employees? So to begin, yes, absolutely. Uh, the University of Georgia and anybody who's paying anyone has a responsibility to <clears throat> increase their minimum wage to be a living wage, that their wage floor is at least, uh, I would say 15 bucks an hour, but certainly at least the 1160 an hour that the MIT calculator recommends. Now, different organizations have different means. A small local business or nonprofit is gonna have a harder time doing that. A gigantic institution like the University of Georgia can do that. Um, and, and absolutely needs to. You know, beyond that, the University of Georgia could also be more friendly to unions, so they could be advocating for those wages as well as other improvements to their working conditions. And when it comes to the commission's role in all this, you know, anybody would tell you, I think, that uh, the mayor and commission don't really have formal power over the university at all. Um, but what I think we need to recognize is that the relationship between the county government and the University of Georgia is, I would describe, an abusive relationship. The University of Georgia owns an, um, an immense amount of the land in this community and doesn't pay taxes on it. They do not pay their fair share into this community in terms of the formal structures of taxes and fees. And they also don't pay their fair share to this community in terms of paying their workers a living wage. And in addition to banning undocumented people from attending their uni university in the first place and on and on. And so I think we need a mayor and commission that is willing to speak up to the University of Georgia that we need to be loud about this. I think there's a way to do that that invites collaboration, but it starts by telling it like it is. And, and what's currently happening is not working. And, and it's directly related to that poverty and wealth inequality that so many of us are tired of talking about. The University of Georgia has an opportunity to be a leader. And I think the Clark County government needs to not only set the example, but be willing to call out the university and invite them into that process. Okay, thank you. And uh, so now, Jerry, same question, UGA wages, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I certainly do think they need to, to raise their minimum wage. Uh, they did it uh, somewhat a couple, three or four years ago. Uh, I used to work at the university uh, when they did that. Um, the, the relationship between UGA and, and, the, and the county government isn't very good right now. And, and part, part of the reason is it used to be, we had a good communications, we had uh, an annual dinner together where we, we shared ideas and notions. Uh, and we even talked a, a time or two about, about their wages. Uh, but that relationship has broken down in the last, uh, I would say, two years. Uh, I, first, we got to repair that relationship. Um, we, we are seen as adversarial to them. Um, th that's not healthy. The communications isn't occurring. Uh, we got to fix that. Um, as far as they're not paying taxes and so forth with this, you know, that's, that's a state law problem again, but they do provide a, an awful lot of support to this community in terms of, of their, of their, their student teachers. Um, they have the outreaches that they do. Uh, we need to amplify those things and let people know more about them uh, as, as the university does, although they've got a pretty good government relations department, they're communicating uh, with us uh, weekly. Um, so I, I, I agree with much of what Jesse's saying, uh, but we've got to first repair that relationships. And that's up to each and every commissioner to do. It's not something that we do because we decided to. We have to do it because each of us decide to build a relationship with the university. And that's uh, I mean. can, <clears throat> can I ask you real quick, can you take a few seconds to just briefly explain what, what happened? Why is that relationship broken down? You know, I don't really want to go into that. It gets into it gets into personalities, um, and I don't I don't I don't want to get 
get into that. Uh, there's just some adversarial relationship between the commissioner, some of the commissioners and the university itself. And that's, that's been harmful. Okay. All right. Uh, the next question is about SPLOST. Um, we'll go with, we'll go to Jerry first. Uh, you were on the commission when you created the SPLOST list. So uh, explain your thoughts on the 15.6 million in SPLOST money dedicated to helping the county's resolution uh, to go to 100% renewable energy. I think it's by 2035. 2035. Uh, yes. and, and tell us your thoughts on SPLOST in general and how do you want to tier the projects? Well, fortunately, we have some very smart people in our sustainability office, uh, Andrew Sa Saunders and, and, and Mike Horton. Uh, Andrew's serving as the director of, uh, of uh, general services now. But, um, you know, we've, we've been moving in this direction with our solar farms at far farm at the uh, water treatment plant on the east side. Uh, we're putting uh, solar panels uh, on our buildings. We have new new buildings on the on this side in this district. A new fire department, a new agriculture extension center, which are uh, have solar panels on their roofs. Uh, so we we just we have to we have to allocate the money carefully and and most effectively. And some of it isn't just renewable energy. It's also using our using uh, less energy, uh, which helps us get there. So the retrofitting of LED lights and all those kinds of activities, which are also part of what's going on and really we're almost done with that is, is part of it. So uh, I think, I think the, using alternative energy on our buildings and also sourcing our energy from, from uh, renewable sources, you know, you can, you can do that. You can tell Georgia Power, my energy is gonna come from the renewable energy systems. That encourages the power company, which is really the, the crux of the matter encourages the power company to, to start uh, sourcing its energy, building the renewable energy facilities that we need. So it's, it's a long process, but we, we can get there. Okay, thanks. And just to reiterate, Jesse, the question is about uh, how you want to tier or what kind of order you want to do small projects in, and then specifically uh, the 15.6 million for renewable energy. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'll start with, you know, the, I think you mentioned the hundred percent clean and renewable energy resolution and that like a number of promising resolutions, the mayor and commission has passed in this past year. Um, largely those resolutions being led by community um, advocates um, is only going to mean anything if there are policies with teeth and ordinances and projects with money to, to back up that resolution. And so there's a section of our platform called a Green New Deal in Athens. For those who aren't familiar with the concept of a Green New Deal, it's this idea that we have a massive public works project similar to the New Deal under FDR, but that focuses specifically on tackling this global crisis of climate change, which will continue to be a crisis after coronavirus, just as it was before. Um, perhaps the two are even related. And, um, and that when we build that infrastructure, we're paying people a living wage. Now, in communities that suffer from immense poverty and especially racialized poverty, which is most communities in America, but Athens is a kind of glaring example of this. I think that we need to be focusing on projects that build equity in our community, that build up wealth for people of color and black Athenians and people who have historically been marginalized, as well as putting projects in place that help those communities first. So um, SPLOS is not a progressive way of taxing the community. It is a way for us to get funds from the university and tourism and so it can be worthwhile, but I think it's only worthwhile if we have a list of projects that is completely focused on that equity component. Um, and of course, tackling the issues of climate change and the environment and environmental sustainability and health is, is very related to that. Um, but it's not just about the, the community voting. You know, I think the community voted overwhelmingly in favor because there's a lot of good stuff on there. But we also need to be letting the citizens and residents of Athens determine those projects during the process of generating that list. I'm very disappointed that the mayor and commission overrode the Citizens Advisory Committee with the Classic Center. And um, it's not necessarily that that was a bad proposal, but I think it begs the question of why the mayor and commission's own appointed Citizens Advisory Committee was against that and, and what's broken about our process of informing and including residents as we build out these projects moving forward. Okay, real, real, real quick, I'd, I'd like to hear Jerry uh, take 30 seconds to respond to why you overrode 
the Citizens Advisory Committee on the Classic Center, please. Oh, it's about 600 jobs is why, uh, and career paths for people who can enter into the hospitality industry and have a real career uh, in our town. Uh, that's why. Okay, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> can I just real quick, I have kind of a parallel question, if that's all right. I'm sorry? May I ask a parallel question, if that's all right? Uh, Okay, well, I'd like to move on, actually, if that's okay. okay sure. I've got some more questions, but uh, but I'll go I'll go to you first, Jesse, for this one. Um, and I think I know what both of y'all are going to say because this actually came up at the commission meeting last night. But do you support the county government's continued use of unpaid inmate labor on county projects? Um, so, if you care to elaborate further, uh, Jerry, I, my question about the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee and the Classic Center isn't about the nature of whether the project was worthwhile, but why the people on the Citizens Advisory Committee didn't agree with you on that. And, and what is the role of the commission in building that um, understanding of the people who are literally the most involved residents in the process? Um, but uh, as far as unpaid inmate labor, I the, the last big project I took on before stepping down from the, the board of Athens for Everyone was to dig into this question of, uh, what's going on with the inmate labor situation in Clark County? How much are people paid? You know, we, we think that they're not getting paid anything because Georgia is one of few states that pays zero. But do they get some kind of other uh, compensation, maybe on their commissary or something? How many people are used and where? And we learned two incredible things when we dug into this data, which we had to dig for um, because we didn't at the time have any allies on the commission to take up this cause. The first was that there are hundreds of people who are literally trapped in this slave labor situation where they're locked in cages all day and only let out to do work for free for the community. And, and in addition to learning how many people and where they're working for our Clark County government, we also learned that the county government in its budget, in its description of these jobs, values that labor. If we just divide evenly the number of hours by the total amount of money they value at, at $18 an hour. So we've learned that the Clark County government is admitting, in its agreement with the state government, so the state government is also admitting that these jobs that are paying zero are actually worth $18 an hour. So I think we need to completely end the practice of unpaid labor. labor. It's, in my opinion, the most horrific thing that our, our county government does. And we need to use our opting out of that process to elevate the discussion so that we can really work to transform the prison industrial complex more broadly on a regional and national level. I think we have a real potential to do that. Um, and we need to turn those jobs that are currently fundamentally exploitative into living wage jobs. I think we should pay people the $18 an hour that it's valued at. And in order to reach the same population, I think we should specifically hire people who have recently gotten out of prison or who otherwise have a felony record and struggle to find work. Um, we've learned that the Georgia State Department of Corrections, at least, unless something changes, is not going to take money from the county government to pay inmates directly. So paying them for their labor while incarcerated, unless something changes, is not an option. I think we need to take the next creative solution. All right, thanks. So, uh, Jerry, go ahead. This this was a topic of discussion at the commission meeting last night, so. Yeah, uh, first of all, back to the Citizens Advisory Committee. They're an advisory committee. It's up to the mayor and commission to make the final decisions. And it's our responsibility to do what we think is right, even if the Citizens Advisory Committee didn't advise it. Now, as far as inmate labor, I don't like it at all. And to be clear, these are state prison inmates. These are not county jail inmates. These are There's a facility here from the State Department of Corrections. When we talked about this a few years ago, I was all for not renewing that contract. Um, it would have cost us money. Because, well, actually we're paying $18 an hour anyway. Um, we, we went into the discussions with them most, more recently, and we talked about how about we provide training uh, and welding and, and job skills so that they're better prepared when they, when they do serve their time uh, to, perform, um, to, perf to perform a job. Uh, I'm still much, very much in favor of that, and I'm hoping that we'll take that up and get that conversation up again. Uh, if the state won't, take, won't, won't pay them, then we need, to, we need to reward them in some way that, that may be even more, more useful than money. All right, thank you. Uh, we've got a little bit of an open-ended question here, so this might be interesting. Um, uh, if elected, you'll likely be working with people who might not agree with you, which may set back campaign promises and delivery. Uh, what do you believe is one thing you're advocating for you know you can realistically get done? 
Uh, I believe it's your turn to go first, uh, Commissioner E. Smith. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I have a very long list of things that I want to get done. Um, I, I want to improve. Yeah, I mean, improve public safety. I think our, our police officers need a raise. We're training them and they're and we're training them well and, and they're going to other counties because they're more qualified and they make more money. I think we need a stronger set of anti-discrimination ordinances. We have this one ordinance in place that only applies to bars. It's almost unenforceable. Uh, and, and people are very reluctant to, to, to report violations. We need to, we need to get our Office of Inclusion involved and come up with some ideas for some more uh, and stronger anti-discrimination ordinances. Um, I think we're gonna make progress on commercial redevelopment uh, in the district. Uh, we was able to change some zoning laws over the last few years, uh, and we are seeing an influx of businesses now on the corridor. Um, of course, we're gonna continue with our workforce and affordable housing. Uh, the north side of town, the Old Bethel Project is a big one. I think we can achieve the idea of giving uh, our procurement policies, giving uh, favor to our local and small businesses so that we can, you know, we're going to spend $330 million in the next 11 years. Uh, we need to keep as much of that money in town as we possibly can. By in town, I mean that money going into people's pockets who live here. Um, I think we're going to get commercial air service at, at, at Ben Epps. I think the coronavirus thing is going to set us back a ways, but I think we're well on the way of, of getting a, a regularly scheduled airline in at Ben Epps, which would be a, a, a real boon for us in terms of, uh, of, of our economic development. It's gonna attract uh, more companies. It's gonna make coming here as a tourist easier, coming here to conferences easier. We're gonna build a new West Side Park uh, on, uh, in, 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 at least on the West Side. It might be in District 6, it might be in District 10, but we're gonna build a new West Side Park. We've got the money to buy the land and we know of ways that we can get grants to start building out infrastructure. Sidewalks on, uh, Eps on um, uh, Mitchell Bridge Road, we need a sidewalk that connects Atlanta Highway to Oglethorpe Avenue, which would create uh, a great uh, a great way to, to, to move around. Right now, there are no sidewalks on Mitchell Bridge Road, and there are hundreds and hundreds of homes, and a lot of them are occupied by people who are, are aging in place, and they need to be able to, to recreate and go to the store. If we also had a sidewalk that connected uh, from, Old, from Macon Highway to Atlanta Highway on Timothy Road, we would actually have a pedestrian loop around the entire town. Um, okay, thanks. I'm, I'm gonna have yeah, to stop you there. Sorry, okay. uh, we're going over time, but uh, that was quite a list. So uh, Jesse, the question was one realistic thing that you can get done, but if you have multiple ones, I guess go ahead and talk about that. I guess I'll go for the multiple two, but I, I you know, we worked very hard in 2018 to elect a progressive slate of commissioners. Athens for everyone. I was working really hard with a lot of folks to win the, the whole, you know, all six races. It was very, very exciting. And all of those people who won committed to a large number of things that they've yet to follow through on. And so I think what it's really going to take is people to champion these causes. It, it, I think it takes rethinking what our role as commissioners are to be legislators, to recognize that we direct the manager's office and the attorney's office. We're seeing in this coronavirus crisis that they are very willing to take direction, that they want that direction from the mayor and commission. And so what we need are commissioners who are really going to champion this stuff, really work, make the hundreds of employees for the Clark County government work for the people and with the mayor and commission as representatives of the people work for what the mayor and commission directs them to do. So yes, we do need anti-discrimination ordinances. We do need to end the single family ordinance. We do need to have a better run, transparent, publicly run EMS system. We do need expanded public transit that's fair free. We do need to end the, the contract of Securus to get rid of the for-profit phones and a bunch of other things that are wrong with our, our jail and our prison system. I've been fighting for all of these things for years and I'm really excited to hear that this, in this election cycle, Commissioner Neesmith and other incumbents have for the first time come around and begun to publicly support these things, but they've been somewhere between silent and oppositional to them for years. So, you know, part of this is we get more people on the commission who support these things and it's just easier to get done. Uh, but part of it also is that we need leaders who don't just sit down the first time they bump into something. So like the question of uh, unpaid inmate labor, 
you know, and then the, the Georgia State Department of Corrections says, well, we're not going to take the money. We need commissioners who are going to persist and keep working for solutions to make it happen. Okay, thanks. You know, that, that, almost, that, that almost sounded like closing statements, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, we, we're going to ask one more question, and then we're going to go to closing statements because we did start a few minutes late. Uh, okay, no, apparently we're just going to go ahead with closing statements. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Jesse, if you want to continue, uh, you've got, you'll each have two minutes to make a closing statement, please. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm so grateful to have had this time to discuss what we can do and how I think we can do it if we have the courage. And I want to share why, why I'm running and why I think this time is so important. Quite simply, Athens is my home and home is people. I love the people who make up this community. It's quite literally where I've found family and I believe in us and I believe we can do better. So how do we do better and what role does a commissioner play? I think we start by asking the questions that get to the roots of our problems. What does equity look like in our city? Who has access and who's left out? How do we become a more just community? And then we recognize that this pandemic is exacerbating all the crises that have been normalized, extreme poverty and wealth inequality, the lack of affordable decent housing, low wages and working conditions, unpaid inmate labor, horrific conditions in our legal system and its cages, on and on. But given the failures of state and federal government, we are seeing the importance of local government in this crisis. And in response to this moment, I think we need leaders who will hold the ship steady through the storm and also have their compass aimed at a brighter horizon. We need proactive people who legislate with a clear vision for a better society and who will help lead the way in building it. we have been working hard alongside many amazing people here in Athens for more than a decade to fight for meaningful solutions. We've won living wages, expanded public transit, some measures against discrimination and more, but we still have so much to do. I see people in our neighborhoods deepening the grassroots networks, fighting together to get through this crisis, just as we fought to get through the day-to-day -day that kept us so busy and tired before any of us thought of the term shelter in place. And my extensive experience in community organizing has led me to step up in this moment because I know I'm not alone, because I know this isn't really about me at all. And I know the people of Athens are ready like I am to transform our city in real ways. So our new normal will be much better for all of us. We'll end unpaid inmate labor and win living wages for all workers. So we find a way to make large developers and institutions like UGA pay their fair share while ensuring regular people can afford to live here. So we abolish the single family ordinance and enact a renter's bill of rights. So our EMS service is no longer held hostage by a for-profit corporation, but functions transparently and efficiently for the public good. So we finally get strong anti-discrimination legislation, fair free transit, decriminalization, and a more compassionate and humane approach to public safety. We bring the government out of city hall, share power among our community. So this isn't just a time we survive, but a time in which we lay the foundation for a home in which everyone can thrive. You can learn a lot more at jesseforathens.com. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And now, uh, Jerry, your closing statement, please. Yes. Well, we face new problems now because of the pandemic. We're going to have to recover. We're going to have to get those jobs back, get those businesses operating again. Until we do that, we don't have money or people to do much of anything. That's my first priority, and it starts with the budget that we're working on now. And it starts with... Um, the, the projects that we are working on now and the distribution of that measly $4 million in such a way to, to help our businesses and our people survive. I'm a servant leader. It's a concept that I learned early in my life, which is simple. The best way to lead is to serve. If you're a boss, the way that you have an effective organization is you serve your employees, you serve your staff. What are their needs? Make sure that that their goals are clear, then they get all that they need to do their jobs and all that they need to have the best lives that they can. I apply that as a, as a commissioner as well. I serve the people. There are many, many jobs to do as a commissioner. Paving streets, uh, zoning, many, many things. Uh, each and every one of those things is important at that moment. We will get through this and we will continue to make, make progress uh, as a community and as, and as community leaders. And I intend to continue my role as a servant leader for this district and this city. And I also believe that the collaborative spirit of this commission um, is incredible. That we have leaders and, and thought leaders on this commission that come up with great ideas they communicate, they share, 
Uh, and we, we, we tend to move together. And I'm very excited about that. And I hope to continue to be a part of it. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, and so we're going to have to wrap it up now. Um, I'd like to thank Athens for everyone for hosting this and organizing it. Uh, I'd like to thank the candidates, uh, Commissioner Neesmith and Jesse Houle. And remind everyone that our next debate will be uh, the District 4 candidates, and that'll be Friday at 5 p.m. Uh, here at the same location on the Athens for Everyone Facebook page. So Thank thanks you, very much. I uh, appreciate everyone viewing, everyone who's sending questions. Uh, sorry we couldn't get to all of them. We had some really good ones, and we'll see you all in a few days. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Blake.